Now, it's often said that the Catholic Church played a less than noble role in World War II. It kept silent to preserve itself. But author Mark Riebling claims that's not the whole story. Not only did Pope Pius, the Pope at the time, use the Church to spy on Hitler, he even approved assassination attempts. Mark is the author of Church of Spies. Mark, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sean. Now, I suppose the, the most widespread criticism of Pius during World War II was that he seemed to keep very silent. He, di- he didn't make many public declarations about the Nazis or what the Nazis were doing. In your book, you say there, there were a specific set of reasons why he did that. Yes, the primary reason, according to the tapes that the Pope made, he made secret tapes of his own audiences with the German cardinals in 1939, which is one of the discovery of my book, Church of Spies. And these tapes show that the Pope was very afraid that the Church would break away under Hitler, as it did under Henry VIII in England. And the Pope wanted, above all, to avoid that. So he listened to what the German bishops were telling him through their cardinals, and he avoided any overt any overt conflict with Hitler, but at the same time, he decided that because Hitler was really the Antichrist, and he tried to exercise Hitler's soul in midnight ceremonies by remote control in his Vatican apartments, when that didn't work, he decided to pursue contacts with the German resistance against Hitler. So it was really a two-track policy. Explain to us, what is the doctrine of tyrannicide? Well, that's uh, something that goes back to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and what it simply says is that when a ruler or tyrant becomes so wicked and so evil that the people feel a great need to get rid of him and have a, a better government, there are certain conditions that, which need to be met. You can't just overthrow anybody just because you don't like them. And these conditions are spelled out in great detail and especially are picked up by the Jesuit theologians of the 16th century. And this became very important when the Vatican and the Jesuits were resisting Queen Elizabeth and trying to install Mary Queen of Scots and the powder plot, which a lot of people may have heard of. These things then became, because they were so controversial, were sort of buried under the Vatican's liberalization policies moving toward the 20th century. But as the Second World War came upon the scene, these doctrines were in the DNA of the Church, and they proved quite handy, especially since um, Protestants had a more difficult time trying to get their head around removing regimes. The Vatican has a a spy network. It has a secret service. Are these uh, men and women who are specifically spies or they happen to be members of the clergy as well? Well, one of the great lessons of Church of Spies is that you don't need a vast bureaucracy of people devoted specifically to intelligence in order to have uh, an intelligence system with global reach. So the easy answer is no, they don't have a spy service per se, but in a way that makes them all the better covered because priests have an excuse to be anywhere at any time, and they have an opportunity to can collect information and pass it on through their worldwide system of communications. They basically inherited the Romans' road networks and communication networks. So, and there's also a a sense in which the church had to operate secretly for the first 300 years of its existence because it was not yet the official religion of the Roman Empire. So we're all familiar with the Church of Saints and a Church of Sinners, but there's also a Church of Spies. And the Church Fathers developed uh, something called the Discipline of Secrecy, which developed from the Mark Gospel because there were many examples there where Jesus was acting secretly and telling his disciples not to tell anyone what he was doing and so forth. So this is all in the DNA of the church and the crucible of the second world war kind of acted as a a situation in which the church reverted almost to its primitive forms as a clandestine organization would it be the case that uh, specific orders of priests or specific priests would have been entrusted with this work because presumably he he, he, Pius didn't feel he could trust everyone in the church Well, the church is not a monolith. There's certainly different aspects, and many people, even clergy, viewed themselves more as, say, Croatians than as priests in some cases. They were priests of the nation, and while the men of God, they also felt very strong national ties. One of the reasons that the orders developed is because the bishops in many countries, especially Germany, were so nationally inclined that it, it was difficult for the Pope to sort of break through that, or for Rome to break through that. So the orders, for instance, the Jesuits especially, report directly to Rome, and so therefore they allow the Pope a way to bypass the bishops, as the bishops are particularly cozy when the, with the government, especially since in many cases the bishops are appointed only with the permission of the local government. 
So the orders developed, and this proved to be the case, especially in Nazi Germany, as a great way to sort of have behind-the-scenes action. But within that, there were a select few. So, for instance, in the Bavarian province of the Jesuits, there was the leader, Augustine Roche, and he had two particular people on whom he relied for special missions, such as liaising with um, with Hitler's uh, would-be assassins. And then Father Roche, in turn, ha- had a direct line to the Pope's right-hand man, a Jesuit advisor in Rome. I would call it a secret, sacred social network. It was very select few people, kind of an elite within an elite. In terms of spying, did they manage to get their hands on, on much uh, useful information? And who did they then give it to? Well, that's a fascinating question, Sean. So some of the best information they received was of a military nature. We call it indications and warning in, in the intelligence business. They had very good intelligence of Hitler's war plans on three occasions. First, of his desire to invade the Scandinavian countries, Norway, in 19, April 1940. Second of all, in May 1940, when Hitler invaded the Low Countries in France, and third, in June 1941, when Hitler invaded Russia. In all three of those cases, sources in the German military, including the head of Hitler's bodyguard, had reported to a Vatican agent who was quite wily. His name was Joseph Mueller, the nickname Joey Ox, very colorful character. (laughs) He would smuggle these reports by flying them in a single-seat plane over the Alps, and he would then present them to a Vatican agent in Murano, who would take them down to the Vatican where they were stored in a safe, which was disguised as a red book on the top shelf of the Pope's library. So they had a very elaborate system of clandestine communications, which could convey warnings from uh, sources in the German military, who, by the way, were many of these conservative characters in the German military, distrusted Hitler. They saw him as a revolutionary uh, in a kind of utopian sense. They were worried that after Hitler won the war, he would destroy the aristocracy, he would destroy the church, both confessions in Germany. So so they were very worried, and they wanted to do a, a deal with the West, uh, with the Chamberlain government and then with the Churchill government, to stop the war. And they found in the Vatican a willing intermediary to engage in these secret peace talks and intrigues to get rid of Hitler and end the war. But going back to that information that they got, the Vatican just held on to it. They didn't pass it on to the Allies. No, they did pass it on, Sean. Oh, they yeah. passed it on. In each case, they passed it on directly. They had a very convenient means of passing it on, which was that the British ambassador to the Holy See, his apartment in the Vatican, the back of it, the back balcony, abutted onto the Vatican Gardens. And another person whose apartment abutted on the Vatican Gardens was the Vatican crypt keeper, a German exile named Monsignor Ludwig Koss, who saw the Pope every day. And so there was a very easy means of, at midnight, going into the back of each other's apartments without anyone seeing it. They could pass on information. It would, it would get to London that same night. But of course, the oldest story in the books in intelligence history is that a warning is, is received and it's not taken seriously. There are often many reports, and most of them prove false. The one that proves true is always the one that's sort of not listened to. So in all of these cases, the British government and the Allies did not did not react to the information which was proved correct. Now you did uh, refer to this already and this is supposed the most astonishing uh, revelation in your book, that there were three separate occasions when Pius approved plots to kill Hitler. Now was that an attempt by the Catholic Church per se to kill Hitler or were they aiding and abetting people within the German high command, etc.? Well, I'd say more of the latter, and I I subtitled Church of Spies, I called it the Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, and that was a deliberate choice. It's not the Church as an institution, and Pius XII was very careful, according to the sources. He said that he didn't want the whole Church to be implicated if it were found out. He wanted the responsibility to just go on him. So he said, tell the British government, I'm involved as the Pope, but this is not the Vatican as the Vatican. This is something I'm doing as a Pope and as a person, and the responsibility is on me. It's sort of difficult to get your mind around. It. But, for instance, let's say, I don't know if anyone remembers what during Ronald Reagan's presidency he was doing in Central America. He took that upon himself and did it out of the back door of the White House, not through the CIA and not through the, the organized bureaucracy. He, he did it in the person of the president. And that's how, before these bureaucracies arose, a lot of secret matters were handled throughout history. So this was pretty daring for the Pope to do. But we know that in the first plot, from October 1939 to May 1940, the Pope was involved as an intermediary. His lay agent in Germany, Josef Mueller,
Mueller, Joey Ox, was very trusted. He was the go-between with uh, German military conspirators. Pius XII's right-hand man in the Vatican, Father Robert Leiber, assigned code names to everyone in the operation, and Pope Pius XII was codenamed Chief, and the other people had various code names, which were kind of creative. But in the end, what happened was that Hitler invaded the West before the plotters could act, although the Chamberlain government had really gone astonishingly far, I think, in terms of, of, of meeting German peace conditions so that there actually could be a, a viable peace. In the second plot, the, the Jesuits, the German Jesuits, and particularly three German Jesuits that I discuss in my book, were operatives on the ground in Germany in a series of plots from about the end of 1941 to spring of 1943. This, again, was, was known by the Vatican, and it was through a line of communications. They, they were tacitly approving of what the Bavarian Jesuits did, which was, in, in many cases, kind of amazing. They traveled in disguise at night on trains. They pretended to have girlfriends and strolled in front of the Gestapo to try and establish their alibis and um, things like that. But they also, the German Jesuits, served as intellectual organizers of a very ecumenical underground movement within Germany. And they helped to do things like write a post-war German constitution, which would be used. They knew the planned timing of his death. And the Pope, again, in this second plot, brokered peace terms with the British government. However, the plot failed on March 13, 1943, when a bomb planted on Hitler's plane, which the Pope knew about and approved because he said we are dealing with satanic forces. Well, when the plane climbed at a, to a certain altitude to avoid flak, the fuse froze and the, the bomb didn't go off. In a third plot, the Pope and his German Jesuits were again operatives. There was a fellow named Alfred Delp, who was a German Jesuit. He met with Klaus von Stauffenberg, who was a German military colonel mm. who actually wanted to plant a bomb in Hitler's headquarters. The German Jesuits stole the blueprints to one of Hitler's bunkers, which they had actually, the bunker was under construction and right next door to their Jesuit college in Munich. And in the process, there was dis a dispute over sewage. Apparently, a supposedly Jesuit sewage was leaking into the SS barracks, and there was a lawsuit over this. And in the process of this lawsuit, the Jesuits obtained the blueprints to Hitler's bunker and passed them on to the military conspirators. This all came to a head in July of 1944, when there was a briefcase bombing in Hitler's military headquarters. The bomb was planted by Colonel Stauffenberg. Uh, Father Delp and the other Jesuits then had to go on the run after the bombing wounded Hitler but did not kill him. There were many, many dramatic escapes that these priests, Dominicans and Jesuits, fled across the rooftops. They hid in coal bins, and some of them were hanged. Uh, a few escaped and have told their story, which is, is quite dramatic. It certainly is. The book is called Church of Spies, the Pope's Secret War Against Hitler. Mark Riebling, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean.